Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor. Appreciate the opportunity once again. Um, I want to start off by thanking all of our staff for their unrelenting uh, service to our community. Um, and I would like to highlight a couple of unsung heroes in the organization. One is the, the, the whole team at the Regional Wastewater Facility. As you all know, this is run by our Environmental Services Department. Um, this facility uh, treats the, uh, the sewage of not only the city of San Jose, but uh, many of the surrounding uh, cities. And they've been in operation 24 seven since for them. Uh, no, no choice but to continue operating. Um, and the facility is obviously critical for public health um, every day of the year. Um, and so it was important for the staff out there was to really figure out how to continue operating in the current environment in, in doing so in a safe manner. And just really proud of the team for what they've been able to accomplish in terms of making some changes to the way they work, their scheduling, um, and, and the way they actually do the day-to-day the -day work out there. And so they've been able to continue operations without missing a, a step. Um, and just want to thank the entire team out there. It includes wastewater operations, facilities maintenance, the energy and automation team, uh, the laboratory team, uh, and all the employees out there doing great work uh, to continue to, to operate. Um, the second highlight is, uh, and many of you may know this individual, Jesse Perez, works in uh, facilities and public works. He's actually the building trade supervisor, and he has been deeply involved with responding to COVID from the, the very beginning. I, uh, many of you may see him around City Hall. Um, yeah, he worked to secure uh, Clorox wipes and masks and gloves and gowns and no-touch thermometers and hand sanitizers and isolation shields for for our workforce so they continue to do their work and also for our city facilities and the public that uh, that do come into some of those facilities. Um, these items were obviously in very high demand and it was really due to his relationships with uh, with our suppliers that uh, we were made a priority to those suppliers and we were able to get the supplies that we needed. Uh, Jesse and his team is also responsible for doing all the deep cleaning that we need to do um, at our facilities that are uh, continuing to operate. So I just wanna thank Jesse and our facilities team, our custodians uh, for, for all their work they're doing to keep our, our facilities clean uh, and safe. Um, so as we move into the, uh, the updates, um, you're, you'll hear from Kip uh, today, who's gonna provide an update from, from the EOC. It was his week as the EOC director. Um, I, he'll provide some uh, information on where we're at with compliance on the public health orders, and also give a little bit of a preview of where do we move uh, from here, our current uh, stage of operations into a next stage and beyond. Um, You'll also hear from Lee Wilcox, who will provide an update on federal and state uh, recovery funding. Um, and then also in uh, another update from uh, Kip around food and necessities, uh, Jim Ortball will provide an update on emergency housing. And then we'll hear from Kim Wallish and Michelle McGurk on uh, local assistance programs. And so I'm gonna hand it off uh, for, to Kip for the EOC update. Thank you, Dave. Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager, EOC Director, and presenting on behalf of both uh, Lee Wilcox um, and myself, as well as the entire Emergency Operations Center team in the city who is behind all this work. So on the next slide, you see our uh, roadmap, which continues to guide all of our operations, and it really focuses all of our efforts on a day-to-day -day basis and in our weekly emergency action plans, which are our weekly sprints. So we have, um, at this point, over 400 people in the management of the Emergency Operations Center, which are directly working against these priorities and harnessing the work of hundreds and thousands more across the organization. Um, so next slide. I want to take a double click into compliance, the Sit County's public health order. It is the most important thing that we are doing is to ensure compliance. Cool. Part of what we did yeah. early on was to identify a short list of important actions that we could take that would have the greatest effect on compliance. And actually, let me, just a second, I've got a little bandwidth issue, so I'm going to make sure. Um, so 
these are those actions. And as you can see, we've taken every single one of them. They've included modifying how we manage our parks to make sure that a couple of the key regional parks are closed and facilities are all closed in compliance with the public health order, but that those parks remain available and that the park rangers are now the primary enforcers of the social distancing and compliance. We've had 304 different public service announcements in four languages. We have developed and deployed key messages and tested those messages using a data methodologies to see which ones are most effective in parks to encourage the right types of behaviors. We've worked with trusted local messengers to do social media posts and videos to influence people's behavior. And we have tested all of those key messages using uh, rapid uh, digital testing methods to sort among five or six different options to see what version of the message was most effective for the audience. And then we've been preparing council members and, the, and our staff with a series of toolkits to help implement these. Next slide. Uh, the result, as you can see here, is that Santa Clara County in general uh, are very effectively sheltering in place. We have uh, data here from Google that shows you uh, dramatic drops, uh, obviously, in, in the uh, number of people at the workplace, um, uh, increases in people in their residence, dramatic drops in retail and in transportation use. Uh, the one that's a little touch and go is parks, uh, and that's why we've been paying so much attention to it and keeping a watchful eye to make sure that we're not creating a health hazard by giving people the opportunity to use those parks in a safe manner. If that changes, we'll, we'll get tougher, but at the moment we feel we've got a high level of compliance with the social distancing in the parks. But bottom line, people are sheltering in place. Next slide. If you go even deeper, uh, we have some uh, publicly available anonymized uh, data, which ensures that people's privacy is protected, that allows us to go census block by census block and see who's staying at home. The definition of staying at home here is, very, is a very solid one. If you so much as walk outside your house with your dog, you're counted as not staying at home. So what you see is actually an extremely high level of compliance of people staying at home. I think what's interesting about the graph is uh, you see the shelter in place art, uh, marker, you can see that people began to stay at home in anticipation of the shelter in place even before it was officially ordered. Um, and as soon as it was official, we saw a rapid and consistent compliance with it. So this is a pretty phenomenal and it shows that across the board in San Jose, there's been high level of compliance. Next slide. The result has been pretty amazing locally. We are bending the curve. This is a graphic which shows you coronavirus in a population adjusted manner. So the bigger the circle, uh, the bigger per capita number of coronaviruses. Since we were one of the very first locations in the United States to have coronavirus, we would logically expect that we would actually be the largest circle on this map, when in fact we are nowhere near that. Places like Tallahassee, Atlanta, Boise, um, uh, Salt Lake City are much, much higher than we are um, because of the early, rapid, and comprehensive adoption of shelter in place. Next slide. So we're now all beginning to think about this shift that we're ready to take, uh, maybe more than ready to take, of, of shifting from uh, response and moving into recovery and back into resilience. I want to take a few moments to share our current thinking and understanding of what that is likely to look like so that we can begin together to work through recovery into resilience. Next slide. So as we've talked about before, we had five stages of response going into this from a nice uh, blue of active preparation to the hard red of extreme high response where we are now. We move through those stages relatively rapidly. And as you can see again from the graph of national cases, well before we got the high and right surge of the national epidemic. So our response was coordinated internally through a set of clear stages that helped us understand where we were and what was happening next. Next slide. We're going to move together through recovery into resilience in the same way, kind of stair-stepping back down from red uh, back into blue. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be a little bit longer of a stair-step down than it was a climb up, um, and it is a bit more ambiguous. But what we know, uh, what we're thinking about is the next stages, and we're thinking of them as stage six, seven, and eight, are really this graduated reopening. 
um, as long as there is no vaccine, we will still have to have some measures in place, especially for the most vulnerable, even in stage eight. But we anticipate we can begin to reopen initially as soon as we've got some stabilization of the epidemic and we have the testing, tracing, and isolation capability that we need, frankly, across the Bay Area to ensure that we do not swing back into epidemic without being able to contain it or without knowing that it's happening. Stage seven would be if uh, the next one and stage eight until we would be a near full reopening or as best we could do without the vaccine. Stage nine is when we have a vaccine and we begin to scale the application of that vaccine. Now there's been a lot of conversation on this and it's one of those unknowns. Uh, most folks who know this work are talking about 18 months uh, as an optimistic number, it could be sooner. To give you a sense of it, the fastest ever kind of initiation to full vaccine was from measles. That took three years. Um, our technology is much faster these days. There's every reason to believe we might be able to move more quickly. However, on the other hand, this is a coronavirus and we have as yet no at scale vaccine for the common cold, which is another coronavirus. So it's really hard to know until the science bears through on this. But we won't be able to be at full normal reopening until we have a vaccine that scales. And then we get back to stage 10, our new normal where all of us are vaccinated and, well, I hate to say it, we are preparing for the next possible pandemic and the next zoonotic out, uh, spillover from animal to human, which could be a year from now, five years from now, or 10 years from now. But this is our best gauge at, at how we are moving back to normal and how we are going to be preparing our workforce and our community to work together into resilience. Next slide. So I think as we, we get to this point, it's useful to come back to first principles. When we had the flood in 2017, we operated the recovery from these three principles. And as we've revisited them and refreshed them, we feel they apply to where we are in this moment as we shift from response to recovery. And those principles are be compassion in action, be open, candid and direct, and be one team. Those are largely self-explanatory, but for us, compassion and action means that we really have to think and feel about who is most vulnerable and most at risk and put ourselves in action in service of those who are likely to be harmed the most, whether those are seniors, whether those are uh, uh, disconnected school kids without access to education, or whether those are homeless individuals. Open, candid, and direct means that we do not have the time to meander and have long uh, multi-month conversations on many important issues. We've got to have very quick, candid, direct conversations, face the brutal facts together, make a decision, deb debate a decision, make a decision and deliver that decision. And then one team, uh, we're not going to win this as a collection of de individual departments. We've got to work as a city. We're not gonna win this as just a city. We've got to work with the county and the other cities. And we're not gonna win this just as a collection of government officials. We have to work with our community and our people, our nonprofits and our businesses through this. So that, that one team is a pretty big team that we feel we have to have. Next slide. And so that, that's where we are in our roadmap. We continue to effectively provide the range of essential services. We continue to have our people showing up and doing that good work every single day. We are in high compliance with the public health order and we are moving a great deal of effort and resources toward our at-risk uh, individuals. And we'll talk a little bit more now in depth about recovery and some of the local assistance work we're doing, including feeding and housing. And our next, I believe I'm turning it over to Lee to give us a, a sneak peek at where we are in recovery. Lee, it's all you. Thanks, Kip. Good job. Um, as promised last week, we did a, a deep dive into the recovery process and kind of lay of the land of what the administration at this point in time knew of, of kind of what was happening at the federal level and state level. Um, as a reminder, the, the Treasury uh, portal, who is administering the, the coronavirus relief fund on behalf of the federal government, it did open last uh, Monday and has indicated um, the city submitted its first application um, into the Department of Treasury on Tuesday during the council meeting. Um, yesterday, um, the city did receive a direct deposit from the federal government of $178 million deposited uh, directly to the city. As a reminder, the CARES Act requires that the payments from this fund and that these funds 
uh, are to be used for um, or are necessary for any expenditures occurred during the public health emergency with respect to the uh, COVID-19, uh, that we weren't um, accounted for any of these funds in our most recent budget adopted in this past year, and that all of the incurred uh, funding um, or expenditures need to happen between March 1st and through the end of the calendar year. This is quite large, uh, super high level direction. We are hoping for additional guidelines as promised by the Department of Treasury later on this week on how we can start to utilize this funds. Um, it's important that as we take this next step that we ensure what those funds can be used for because we don't want to be in a position where we start to use this funding and it not be eligible and that we would need to repay. So we will continue to push on these guidelines and have guidelines in place before we start expending these funds. We also spoke a little bit about uh, a CARES Act 1.5 or kind of a bridge legislation that would be between the, the CARES Act and kind of the larger negotiation happening in Congress. And uh, fortunately, um, you know, the, the White House, both houses, um, and both parties uh, came into agreement late uh, last night or early this morning on the Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act. So this is $148 billion um, and is being discussed on the Senate floor as we speak. It is or $310 billion for the Paycheck Protection Act, which $125 billion of that is exclusively for unbanked businesses or sole proprietors. 38 billion for the Nash for national COVID testing and 75 billion for our hospital system. 11 billion, 11 billion of which is for state and localities to develop, purchase, and administer COVID testing on behalf of the local population. Um, and then moving forward, uh, you know, most notably and, and most exciting is both the Senate Minority Leader and President within hours of each other this morning on, on the compromise of this bridge legislation. So that they are both quick uh, starting further discussions and negotiations on a CARES Act 2.0 or a larger piece of legislation that would be focused on uh, fiscal relief to state and local governments for lost revenue from COVID-19, robust infrastructure package across all 50 states, as well as business stimulus and tax incentives for our restaurants, sports industry, entertainment industry, and small business. And then lastly, on the recovery front related to um, our federal government is the our local congressional delegation and the city of San Jose are meeting tomorrow to further prioritize and echo our needs and priorita um, priorities in the second act. With that, I'm gonna turn it back to Kip Harkness. Thank you, Lee. I want to uh, introduce and tee up a conversation with many players here around local assistance, which is our effort to support those who are most vulnerable and most at risk during the response phase and now moving into recovery. Next slide. As you now know, we are charged countywide with feeding and necessities distribution, and our objectives there are to feed our most vulnerable, maximize existing food ne networks, and scale for widespread food crisis. Next slide. We are currently feeding at um, over uh, 2 million meals a week. Uh, that's an increase from when we took over uh, of about half a million meals a week and continuing to go uh, north. Um, so we are anticipating scaling up to at least 3 million meals a week and perhaps more, depending on what uh, the situation requires. Second Harvest Food Bank and many community partners continue to lead this with the grocery distribution and then a number of providers providing uh, meal solutions as well as our school sites, which includes an expansion of school sites to evenings in some cases and um, through closures during the spring break. Next slide. Uh, there is an awful lot of work that needs to be done, um, both on the contractual side and the implementation side, to make sure that we are continuing to support the existing providers while building up our ability to scale up to meet the rapidly growing need. This is an example, a snapshot of the OKRs, objectives as measured by key results that the team is using to measure their uh, key results that are going to move their capacity the most in these three areas of feeding our most vulnerable maximizing existing food networks, and scaling for a more widespread food crisis. 
up to 3 million meals per week. Next slide. The organizational structure that is required to do this, oops, Lee, you went off. The organizational structure that's required to do this is highly complex and uh, requires a, a vast organization in place. And this chart, as soon as it pops back up, gives you a sense of all of the players that are involved in the food distribution internally to us in the emergency operations center. And then I'll pause there and we're gonna turn now to emergency housing and Jim, but I'll let uh, Lee catch up with us on the slide deck and uh, bring you to the distribution piece in terms of the complexity there. Good news is uh, we have a high level of confidence both in our partners and our ability to continue to scale. And we are investing some of our best and brightest in making sure that we are going to fulfill the request of the county that we lead this county wide. So this includes again, the collaboration with schools, the collaboration with Second Harvest, all of the food providers across the board. And we are going to take that mandate very broadly uh, so to make sure that anybody who has insecurity with food has access to the food they need during this crisis. With that, I will turn it over to Jim Ortball, who's been leading uh, many of our housing related and emergency housing efforts from the Emergency Operations Center to give you a bit of a, a deeper dive into some of the emergency housing issues. Jim, it's all you. Great. Thanks a lot, Kip. Uh, Jim Orpal, Deputy City Manager and Emergency Operations Coordinator. Uh, next slide, Lee, please. So I just wanna quickly recap um, how we got to the place we're at today. So on March 4th, the governor issued a proclamation in a California state of emergency. He issued an executive order that followed that and the state government passed SB 89 it allocated funding, suspended regulations to speed the delivery of emergency housing in our state to address those that are most vulnerable. On March 16th, Santa Clara County issued a shelter at home order and gave direction to all individuals and then to all cities in the county that we need to shelter our homeless residents to do as much as we possibly can uh, during this emergency declaration. Following that state and county direction, the city manager and the emergency operations center declared a shelter crisis on March 20th. And then the council ratified that uh, emergency COVID response and the shelter crisis declaration on April 7th. Uh, they suspended a number of regulations, general plan, zoning, uh, regulations around procurement, uh, secret review, a number of things allocated funding over $17 million and directed the city manager to immediately stand up emergency interim housing on identified sites. So that kind of got us to the direction we've been working at under the last two weeks. Lee, if you could go to the next slide, please. So this slide is information we shared on April 7th and represents the sites that we rapidly assessed to move forward with emergency interim housing. Just want to recap kind of how we've triaged these sites over the past two weeks. Three sites are really not feasible to stand up for emergency interim housing on an emergency basis and probably really not on a long-term basis either. Those are in red. We're essentially not proceeding on those sites at this point in time. Uh, four sites are in orange and we believe those also are not feasible to stand up during this COVID and shelter emergency that we have. Uh, they still may have some promise, but for a variety of reasons, including our ability to, to lease control the sites, to get the donation control, or dealing with uh, utilities or site grading, they just were not feasible to stand up in this immediate urgent period. So that leaves us the two sites that are in green still on the page, Monterey and Bernal. That is the site that I uh, briefed the council on last week that we we're moving uh, very urgently and expeditiously. Uh, that one probably has the fastest path towards being able to stand up emergency interim housing. We own it, we control it. Uh, it has good access to utilities. There are a few barriers and we have a contractor ready to start that now. So that's something uh, that we are ready to move on. The Evans Lane at Almond and Expressway, 
uh, is a site that obviously it was right below the line uh, when we discussed two weeks ago. Um, it is a future affordable housing site, but we believe an interim use uh, at this time, we believe we can stand it up during this emergency. We believe that it can be for interim family use and ultimately be a path to permanent affordable housing for the residents that would be uh, in, these, uh, in this site, in this community on an interim basis. So we see that as a very feasible location. So we're ready to move forward with that on a somewhat similar timeframe as Monterey and Bernal. Uh, that didn't provide us with as many sites as we previously had. We had four sites in our original efforts two weeks ago. Obviously, we've lost a couple since that point in time. Uh, so we were trying to uh, identify an additional site or two if possible. Uh, that caused us to go back to the list, particularly the Caltrans sites, which we see as having uh, pretty good potential. Uh, Lee, I'll ask you to go on to the next slide my last slide. Uh, so I've, I've talked through the Monterey at Bernal site. I've talked through the Evans Lane site as well. And the Rue Ferrari site is a Caltrans owned site at 101. Uh, it had rated very high on all of our previous evaluations. It's a, a large parcel, it's level, it has good access to utilities. And so we explored that with Caltrans about the feasibility of rapidly moving on that site. The governor did issue uh, orders to state agencies to help in the um, sheltering of individuals to work with partners throughout the state to try and do whatever we can in a short period of time. And Caltrans has responded remarkably well and is their feeling that they can work with us, get this site under city control and enable us to uh, develop it for emergency interim housing during this period of time. So at this point in time, we have three sites that we're prepared to move forward with. The council's aware we have two existing sites where we've done uh, bridge housing, the Mayberry site uh, in District 3, that one is operational, and then the Felipe 101-280 site in District 7, uh, that is under development now. So uh, this represents our current uh, expedited efforts to follow council direction and deliver as much emergency interim housing uh, during this crisis as we possibly can uh, to serve and support uh, social distancing and safe places for people to shelter during the COVID crisis and then be useful uh, afterwards to address our city shelter crisis as well. And I'll conclude there and that ends my presentation. Okay, and I think now we turn it over to Kim to take us into a deeper dive around local assistance. Kim, all yours. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. It is nice to see you, even virtually. Um, I'm speaking to you in my role as the director of the liaison branch in the EOC. And we're going to talk this afternoon about local assistance. Uh, what we're doing and what we need to do to help San Jose residents and small businesses and nonprofits recover from the impacts of this crisis. I know you've had two very good high-level presentations by Michelle McGurk uh, about the local assistance framework. Uh, and this afternoon, we're going to give you a more specific briefing. Um, we're going to do four things. First, we're going to talk a little bit about what do we really mean by local assistance in the context of this unique local emergency. Uh, second, we're going to convey that the intent of local assistance is to identify and serve our most vulnerable uh, residents. And we're gonna talk about what we mean by that. And to do so, we have two guest presenters, uh, Pancho Guevara, the executive director from Sacred Heart Community Services, and Jennifer Loving, the CEO of Destination Home, just to give us a view from the front lines about the challenges that we face now and we're likely to face in the future. Third, we're going to share the specific work that our local assistance team that has been stood up in the EOC, what we've been doing, including the creation and ongoing managing of a virtual local assistance center. And then last, we're going to talk a little bit about economic recovery in San Jose, because it's clear to us 
that doing the best possible job with local assistance uh, will aid ultimately economic recovery. And the theme, as Kip mentioned, is really one team. The, I just want to emphasize so much the importance of us working in partnership with you, with the mayor and council, uh, and with the community organizations, um, especially over the next several months, which are going to be critical. So let's, let's start. Um, just to talk a little bit about a typical emergency and what local assistance means in that. If you think about it, the, a typical emergency, there's an event, there's a disaster, it's a couple hours, maybe it's a couple days. Then there's an immediate aftermath of, of days or weeks or months. And then there's a longer term recovery, which is typically years. So if you think about it in the context of the flood, there was the incident, there's a rescue, there's short-term needs for food, shelter that are met by the Red Cross. Then we had the, af the, the aftermath where we provided interim food and shelter. Council members opened up district centers. And this is where we pull out the playbook for emergency response and it says, stand up a local assistance center. Directly help the people that were affected by the flood help them do things that they needed to do, like replace documents, talk to insurance companies, access resources. And then of course the recovery stage from the flood, uh, particularly for those families and those communities, uh, goes on for years. So we have experience in the context of an emergency, and we stood up a traditional local assistance center at the Shirakawa Community Center in 2017. And that uh, center, you can see it here, was a physical place. It had rooms, it had tables staffed by uh, community partners, by various government agencies. We stood up this center for about a month to help the families that were affected by the flood. We then transitioned the center to City Hall where the housing department managed it for about a month. And then of course, important longer term case management happened through CBOs over many years, especially through Catholic Charities. So if you think about the emergency we face now, it's, it's very different. Uh, the shelter in place is our event, and that is going on for weeks, uh, likely months. We're then going to experience this phased reopening of the economy and, and public life, and that is going to go on for months. Uh, we don't like to think about it, but it's clear there's potential for some looping back to shelter in place and reopening. There's potential for a second wave. And after we get through all of that, as Kip explained, then there's this opportunity for recovery, which clearly will take many years. So in this context of the COVID-19 emergency, you can see that local assistance must be approached very differently. It must start immediately while we're still in the emergency. It must continue for months or potentially longer. A physical center is clearly not possible. And there's a much larger proportion of our population that needs assistance. I mean, virtually everybody is, is affected by this. But the core element of ensuring that our most vulnerable residents have their basic needs met is really important. And that we have a shared interest in trying to contain the damage from the emergency so that we can uh, make it uh, to economic recovery. So I wanna share um, a, a slide which shows how the needs have arisen suddenly and they're steep and they're widespread. And I know we've seen charts about unemployment claims for the state and the nation, but this is the data for Santa Clara County. And so you can see the historic high was in March of 2010, 37,760 claims. And you can see 10 years later, March of 2020, 46,606 claims. And that's a partial count. That's not through the whole month. And that is before EDD started taking applications for independent contractors, sole proprietors, and gig workers, which will start next week. So I say this just so you can see the situation is very unique because compared to a recession, there's a sudden impact. There's not a three year run up in need. And the situation is unique compared to most disasters because clearly everyone is affected. And this is just one indicator. 
So I know you've seen this slide before, but I want to say it again that in local assistance, our focus is on our most vulnerable. And that is most our most vulnerable residents, but also our most vulnerable small businesses and our most vulnerable nonprofits. And so because this is so important, we have two special guests um, who have been deeply involved in understanding and providing the local assistance that we have available for residents, particularly the funds that have been raised through the Silicon Valley Strong Funds. So we have, as I mentioned, Poncho and Jennifer, and they're here representing the 15 agency countywide homeless prevention system network that has been in place. Uh, and we're asking them to just share some uh, case examples and describe the situation that they're seeing on the ground with our most vulnerable residents. So uh, Jen and Poncho, please. Hey everyone, I think I'll, I'll go first. This is Jen Loving with Destination Home and thanks for including us today at Council. Uh, this first slide, as you can see, we wanted to show you a little bit of comparison in need as, as we've discussed and as uh, you have funded over the, over the years. We've been running a countywide homelessness prevention system for the last few years. Uh, our, our plan this year was to serve 900 uh, households continuing to ramp up, spending a little over $9 million. Um, you can see how the average costs and really just this was sort of how we were doing this business prior to COVID. Um, when, uh, when, this, when we realized that we were going to be a hot spot uh, for um, the transmission of, of, of this virus pretty quickly, we knew that based on what we've been seeing over the last few years that we would have an, a, just a really acceleration of the people that are already living really so on the margins here um, that, that we already know are paying 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 of their income towards rent. People largely in extremely low income housing categories, the families that we come and talk with you about all the time, um, that, that this is going to be just catastrophic and this would exacerbate because of the, the ways that families are already just trying to, to hang on every single month. So we were able to raise initially a, a pot of money, uh, about $11 million um, or so, that we were first able to put into our existing partnership with Sacred Heart. Um, and we saw 4,500 applications just in days, and really which encumbers that amount of money. So within just a matter of a few days, although website we were using crashed, the amount of applications were overwhelming and uh, we had to stop accepting applications and pivot to an interest list and now we have over 15,000 folks who have asked us for help in less, really less than, I guess, just about a month. Um, so uh, if you go to the next slide, um, we're continuing to raise money and to work really diligently um, some of that work has been with Silicon Valley Strong and with Mayor Licardo, Supervisor Chavez, and um, Chuck Robbins at Cisco has been super helpful in helping us to raise funding. Our goal is to be able to open up um, the process that we're doing now, but with some revised criteria. And I'll turn that over to Poncho to talk a little bit more about that. Thank you, Jen, and thank you to the council for your leadership and concern on this. Um, just to put a human face on this, like one of the families that had that came to apply for this initial round uh, was a woman named Emma who um, happens to live in uh, District 6. And, um, and her kids attend Campbell Union um, School District and she actually cleans houses for a living. And, uh, and so through her job, she only she earns, you know, some money uh, via uh, traditional uh, payment, but also a lot by cash. And then in the aftermath of this uh, of this issue, a lot of folks canceled her uh, uh, her services, being able to come into their homes and help clean their homes, and she was facing this gigantic shortfall. And we hadn't seen her come to Sacred Heart for years uh, to actually access our food pantry, and uh, and she started coming. And this is even before the shelter at home order really kicked in, um, and and really was impacting her. And so she was one of the thousands of folks that applied to us for assistance and she was afraid that she wasn't going to be able to get any kind of help because she doesn't doesn't always doesn't 
a significant portion of her income is via cash and how does she prove this and and because of the 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 lack of clarity about whether or not the uh, the federal government was going to come in with unemployment or other things for people that work for cash that was not present at the at that point and like Jen had said we launched this website about six uh, five days before the president signed uh, that that relief package that included um, some provisions for folks like her but still she was afraid that she wasn't going to be eligible for anything and she pro and she still isn't but it was a big boon to her to know that she could get some assistance. We were able to process her application. She's among the the folks that we've already been able to kick out about uh, uh, almost four million in assistance to date. Of that, we're still processing the last of these applications. But the what's happened is it's given us pause right now over what is happening in terms of developing not only this first round of funding where we had again the forty five hundred that were that we're diligently going through with our uh, homelessness prevention system partners around the county providing this assistance. But the 10,000 households that are on this interest list, we wanted to make sure that we're able to form the criteria that could really prioritize the folks that need it the most. And um, I want to give a specific shout out to Soma Maciel um, and the Officer of Immigrant Affairs and their team to actually that have been instrumental in helping us convene uh, a network of different uh, immigrant serving organization um, organizations, their leadership to have them contact and and survey and get feedback on criteria for a second round, particularly for immigrant families, mixed status households, and documented individuals to make sure that we're developing the right kind of criteria and outreach methods for a next round of funding. And that's what we're looking at and developing right now. We've been able to get a lot of unanimity about how to be able to do that and make families feel safe accessing assistance while at the same time recognizing that the amount of resources that, that, are, are, that are available right now are, are as, as much as the work that Destination Home and the Silicon Valley Strong have done to try to champion this work, the level of need is just overwhelming for folks. And so, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of perseverance and, um, and hope in the community that we can help as many people as possible. Um, but also uh, frustration that, that things like unemployment insurance weren't available, aren't available to such a valuable portion of our community and how do we change that narrative over time. But that's what we're seeing right now and there's a lot of gratitude but a lot of fear um, and still a lot of confusion over what's happening with regard to um, the eviction moratorium and, and the fact that, but most people are paying their rent, they're doing what they can even though they have no income and they're, and they're struggling to, to make sure ends meet. Thank you so much, uh, Poncho and Jen, for, for joining us. I think, I think it's so clear the important work that we all need to do, especially with our extremely low income families and our immigrant families. And you can see that you know, the effectiveness of how we work together, especially the next couple months, can really make a difference. And there's so much that's not in our control, but through our local assistance effort and working through the great collaborative networks that we have in this community, we want to do everything we can to prevent those temporary job losses from becoming permanent, from preventing the situation leading to increases in poverty, equity gaps widening, homelessness proliferating. We want to do everything we can uh, to prevent that, get as many people as we can to the other side in terms of being part of the recovery and moving towards stability and success again. So, so to address these challenges, we've put together a very significant team of city staff who are operating in our emergency operations center uh, as a local assistance team. And the slide here, you can show you who is on this uh, coordinating team, um, but there are many more staff throughout our EOC organization who are actually working together, as you saw, to coordinate food and shelter and do a lot of communication, a lot of connecting of employers and residents with assistance that's available. So you can see um, Michelle and Elsa and I kind of supporting the team. We have three teams, Jeremy Schaffner heading resident assistance, Jeff Ruster heading small business assistance, Carrie Adams Hapner heading nonprofit assistance. And then you can see the various uh, folks, including Zulma from the Office of Immigrant Affairs, Ed Bautista representing food and necessities, our two council liaisons who are fabulous, Sal Alvarez and Gerald Ferguson, uh, Jackie morales friend who you all know, James Stagey working on emergency shelter, Liana from intergovernmental relations, our Amanda Rusco from PIO, 
And of course, you see the key partners here, the city council, the county, and community-based organizations. And so uh, next, I'm going to ask Michelle McGurk, uh, who is the local assistance team leader, to give you an update on how we're approaching this and the specific things that, that the group has accomplished in the last three or four weeks. Michelle? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, Um, I'm delighted to be with you today and um, give you an update on everything and where we're at with our local assistance effort. We really have built a phenomenal team, as Kim said, and we're really taking um, the key that what we do now during the emergency will set the stage for our long-term recovery and returning our community to resilience. Um, our priority and our strategic um, Principles are here before you on the screen. As we keep saying over and over, we prioritize um, those who are most vulnerable in our community. And as we know, many of those folks were already vulnerable. They were already suffering from the digital divide. They were suffering from um, the cost of living in the valley. So we are working um, against that backdrop to really ensure that we can bring services to them. We are leveraging our collaborative relationships and very importantly, not duplicating efforts. We've actually created a rubric that we go through to ask first if anybody's doing the work before we actually start working. And we found some tremendous partnerships out in the community through that effort. A lot of my team is focused on immigration um, information and referrals. That's been very important to ensure that we connect people with the great work that's happening in the community. And in doing that, we want to meet the community where they are. We want to use the kinds of communications need, uh, means that they are, um, that they're used to using. So I think that that's um, been a real um, important thing. Not everybody has a website or a computer that they can connect to. And then we are working with the citywide efforts on expansion of digital and economic inclusion, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that today. Um, and then we're really planning ahead. We're looking towards the end of the recovery and seeing um, what types of things we can do to um, not just get us back where we were, but how can we um, address some of the challenges that were already in place. So um, as I'm going to try to get to the next slide here. Um, as Poncho and Jen men mentioned, the um, financial needs are very significant. This slide gives a snapshot of the various resources that are available to residents, small businesses, and nonprofits. And we've sort of divided out the residents into different categories of workers so that we can see that all things are not equal to whether you're a worker who gets a traditional paycheck at a traditional company uh, as a W-2 worker, um, somebody who is a contract worker or a gig worker, someone working for cash the way um, Poncho described Emma, um, or are undocumented workers. So there are some things that are available to everyone, like free food. Um, unemployment has been expanded through the CARES Act but those funds actually haven't become available yet in California. They'll become available next week. So a lot of our outreach and um, triaging has been around uh, small businesses and, and sole proprietors asking about how they can access those funds. Um, and while our small businesses and nonprofits have access to SBA funds, um, and those ran out. And Thankfully, there's another um, set of funding that's in the works, but as of today, um, many of our small businesses and nonprofits were left out of the SBA Paycheck Protection Funding. So, um, as Kim mentioned, I want to turn over to our Virtual Local Assistance Center. Normally, we go to the community, and we'd be providing face-to-face -face help to our residents in our small businesses and our nonprofits. We'd ask you to open a district office, your constituents, 
And clearly we can't do that right now with COVID-19. So we have brought online a virtual local assistance center that's part of the city's website. And I wanna note that this responded to, que to questions and concerns you raised the last time I was there and uh, when EPIO was there talking with you, you told the EOC that we were putting out great information, but that it was hard to navigate. And so we've decided to make it a lot more um, easy for folks to navigate. When you go to the city's homepage, you can directly assist, uh, access assistance for residents, businesses, and nonprofits. And then I'll take you over. This is our virtual local assistance center. Um, and it has information cataloged in a way that's very easy for people to access. It's mobile friendly. So if you're, if all you have is a smartphone or a friend's smartphone, you can access it really easily. It's part of our EOC infrastructure and um, we can take the site dark when this emergency is over and then reactivate it in the future. And while the site is available for our residents, um, we really anticipate that there will be wide use by those who help our residents, um, those who help them navigate and get resources. So our team is working closely with 311 um, so that the site is a resource for our call center staff as they provide assistance. And similarly, we're working with 211, our local nonprofits, and then making this available to your own council staff as they work with constituents so that um, information is readily available to them right where they need it. But we are not just relying on the web. We're doing a great deal of grassroots outreach and launching that. Um, we wanna reach out in low tech ways through flyers in food baskets and grocery stores and laundromats, using our trusted community-based organizations, um, places of worship, ethnic media, and um, Poncho mentioned the convening that Soma Maciel has done. Um, through that survey work, they found that many of our most vulnerable residents are, they rely on those trusted organizations and their, um, their churches and other places of worship. And then a few um, new methods like WhatsApp and text messaging, as well as the traditional media to get the word out. So this is um, uh, from the unemployment toolkit that we sent to council yesterday. These are some of the, the graphics that are available. These can be printed out if, um, if and given out to the community, but they can also be used in WhatsApp and on your social media. So we wanna encourage you to get the word out about how people can get help and resources. And then I'm going to turn over real quickly and tell you, you've heard a lot about resident assistance today. These are the areas that we've covered so far. One thing that didn't get mentioned that I wanna highlight as um, a big success story is that our Work to Future program has pivoted from being a face-to-face -face program to being virtual. This has been unprecedented, unprecedented how quickly they've worked and they've reached all those unemployment um, numbers that you just saw from Kim, um, those folks are now connecting with work, work to Future online. And um, they have a lot of resources beyond just unemployment resources on their updated website. And they'll be doing a virtual job fair on April 29th. With our small business assistance, um, we've been getting the word out. We've got 40,000 small businesses in San Jose on our email list um, and doing a whole bunch of mass communications around everything from our sick leave policy, our moratorium on commercial um, tenant evictions, avoiding scams, SBA funding. Um, we've also been using a lot of partners like our neighborhood business districts and our ethnic chambers to get the word out. We get anywhere from uh, 20 to 80 one-on-one -on -one, um, inquiries a day through our COVID-19 SJ Business email address as well as our hotline. Um, and we've been doing weekly webinars. Um, I wanna mention that this last week's webinar, we were actually able to um, highlight um, a small business here in San Jose, Academic Coffee 
which has been able to pivot from um, being a traditional coffee shop to actually serving as a community pantry during the COVID-19 um, epidemic. And then we've also been working with a number of partners around loan packaging and technical and legal assistance. We will be announcing very soon that the Silicon Valley Strong Grants will be available probably in a week or two. And um, we also have on the agenda today under um, the CWG item, um, there's an additional contribution proposed of 2.5 million in CWG funds that would go to a small business loan program through our partner opportunity fund. So with our nonprofits, um, the biggest thing that we have been doing beyond information and referral is really working with our existing city grantees. Um, the city is a major grant maker. We are the largest arts grant maker in the Valley and we have hundreds of contracts with nonprofits. So our staff has been working to make sure that our nonprofits are not harmed further from this COVID-19 crisis than they already have been and that we don't penalize them for not being able to make, meet certain grant conditions, um, not holding an event and so forth. Um, our, we've also been working with other nonprofits through convening and collaborating. Um, we mentioned the convening that the Office of Immigrant Affairs has been doing. And we're seeing a lot of our nonprofits move very nimbly to um, pivot and change direction during this crisis. So several are participating in, this, in the city's virtual recreation center. Um, the Tech Interactive has provided digital learning resources online. And while um, we're really sad that the San Jose Jazz Summerfest has been canceled, they have been providing a bright spot with twice a week online concerts through Facebook Live and um, providing a means for the jazz artists to earn revenue when the audience sends them tips. So those are a few of the highlights of the work that we've been doing. So I wanna turn it over to you. You all got an email from Kim. Um, at the end of last week with 10 ways that you, the council, can help. Um, and we just want to remind you of all of the things that you can do to help us help the community. You've heard today about the need, and, and the need is really, really great. We need your help, particularly with fundraising. I'm still waiting for um, those major donors um, to help contribute to Silicon Valley Strong. I want to thank Council Districts 1, um, 2, and um, let's see, I think we've heard also from council, one of the other council districts, um, but we need you guys to send those in and get the word out about, um, you know, donating to uh, Silicon Valley Strong. Thank you for all the newspaper article or newsletter articles you've done, all the social media posts. Um, we'll keep feeding you information about resources um, and so that you can get the word out to your community. And we also um, really need you to let us know about community needs as they emerge. Um, and so the council liaison is part of our team to get the word out. Um, you know, the fundamental thing that we are finding is that what we do today is going to really make a difference for the long-term recovery and it's so many of our residents who were in crisis before COVID-19 broke out um, are really going to need to be able to see the re city recover from COVID-19 in a way that also addresses the underlying challenges. So with that I'm going to turn it back over to Kim to take us to the last slides. Great, thank you, Michelle. So part of thinking ahead is thinking about economic recovery. And you can see, and I think you understand that the shelter in place was about protecting health. The reopening is about protecting health, but balancing that with restoring livelihood and well-being. And I think as we reopen, stabilizing the local economy, 
especially our small businesses and nonprofits, and stabilizing our families is critically important. There was an article in the New York Times uh, yesterday that said in New York City, they're actually anticipating half of their small businesses might close. So that's not acceptable. That really frames what the challenge here is, getting through this reopening phase with enough stability that we can get to recovery. And so I want to just end by saying a little bit about how we're starting to think about what we need to look at for an economic recovery strategy for San Jose. I think we had always anticipated we would ultimately be in recession because our economic growth period had gone on for an unprecedented amount of time. Uh, and downturns are clearly when we, we need to do our best thinking about revisiting and refreshing our strategy. The city put in place after the dot-com the first ever comprehensive economic development strategy that San Jose had, and we did a significant refreshing and revisiting of it after the Great Recession. So just to start thinking ahead, we believe that there are seven uh, areas, if you think about a framework, where we're going to want some city strategies. And this is going to happen in the context of great thinking that will happen in the broader region and the Bay Area and state. But in San Jose, we're going to want to focus on these things. So small business, obviously, is going to continue to be a focus. We had good conversations going on previously about anti-displacement, and we were reframing that as resilience. We really think this broader issue is resilience for our small business community. It's easy to take our major employers and our economic engines for granted when the economy is strong. Uh, and you can see now that about 5% of our city's uh, large employers employ about 65% of our employees. So we're going to be stepping up our direct outreach and coordination with our major employers, especially understanding the new opportunity sectors that may be growing and innovating uh, through this crisis and beyond. With our, um, uh, our residents, before the pandemic, we were having important conversations about how to better connect our lower skilled residents to good jobs with career pathways and to sectors that are hiring. And that work is going to need to continue. It's, it's more important than ever before. Construction and development facilitation. We need to do everything we can to keep the development cycle going for the projects that are under construction and or shovel ready. Uh, construction is a really important source of middle skilled jobs. We know that financial feasibility was already very challenging for housing uh, before the pandemic. We're going to need to figure out how to restart construction and keep development moving as an important engine of our economy. Of course, we're already reaching out to the city's major revenue generators. We need to do everything we can to support the swift return especially of businesses and sectors that generate significant sales tax uh, for the city uh, and so that we can start rebuilding our city's balance sheet. And as you can expect, we anticipate there'll be federal and state stimulus packages that will include some provision of funds for physical infrastructure projects. So we need to be ready with our agency partners to quickly identify infrastructure projects that, that could be implemented quickly and benefit our community's resilience in the long run. And then last, it's clear that um, we're gonna need to plan for an uncertain future and potentially likely an environment where there's greater uncertainty around us than we've experienced in the past. So how do we prepare our community to be self-reliant, to be adaptable, uh, I really believe that we've got a strong start here with local assistance and that we're lucky in San Jose that we have a very strong base of relationships. We have a collaborative culture and we have a very, probably most importantly, a very caring community. So we've done a lot of work. We've got a lot of challenge ahead. Um, half of the entire team, we appreciate the opportunity uh, to take the time to give you this progress report and look forward to, to working with you uh, going forward and uh, turn the program back to Kip. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And on behalf of my colleague, Lee Wilcox, as the directors of the Emergency Operations Center, pleased to present to you this update on the last seven days of work of the Emergency Operations Center and hand it back to the city manager, Dave Sykes. 
Thanks, Kip. I just want to thank the whole team um, and we're available for any questions from the mayor and the council.